Hey, Todd, come in. Could you just list off what you believe? So I believe that Donald Trump uh, was working with QAnon and military intelligence to take down a thousand-year-old cabal that was controlled by an evil satanic cult of pedophiles. And behind these two organizations were interdimensional and extraterrestrial aliens, reptilians on the bad side, and the good guys who were backed by this sort of blue avian bird-like species. There was time travel, there was alternate realities, there was, there was so much. I've probably forgotten more than I remember, to be honest. Time to break the spell. I'll carefully curate itself. Hardly notice how we've changed. How we love and how we We're on a mission to understand how the internet is changing us and what we can do about it. In the first episode, we focused on how tech companies are changing how we love. We now turn our attention to hate. The question is, is the internet conditioning us to be less empathetic towards each other and more hateful in our lives? Yeah. 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 It's tempting to write off Chitarth's conspiracy theories as the fringe, but that underestimates the tech company's role in facilitating and profiting from division. Thanks to the internet, conspiracy theories are now mainstream. I want to see if I can find that video that I first heard about Q on Alex Jones. Infowars, um, Baruch Describe. <laughs> If you are receiving this transmission, you are the resistance. If you're not aware who QAnon is, we're going to go over that. I really wasn't You start to go on YouTube and you start to enter the rabbit hole, don't yeah. you? Yeah. I was studying, I think, one subject that semester. Uh, I was not talking to any of my friends and it was just me and my computer all day and every day. And I was just on the internet, on social media, on Reddit, on YouTube. Conspiracy theories are driven by something called epistemic anxiety. It's this deep yearning for certainty, for truth. But they're like junk food. They never satisfy you. So you look for more and more conspiracy theories. From the outside, we call that rabbit holing. Internally, platforms call that a captive market. I was online for at least 16 hours, 18 hours. Some days I'd be up online for two days in a row. I was just addicted. It was like a drug. My mental state was pretty chaotic. I had been very disillusioned with the mainstream media at that point. That's when I started to listen to Alex Jones and it was very different to the other news broadcasts. Oh, oh, crap. And if you believe the Bible, it's being run by an ancient powerful entity with super advanced intelligence. Infowars is a site set up by a guy called Alex Jones, who's really the first great digital age conspiracy entrepreneur. He saw the market opportunity in the way in which conspiracy theories, hate, misinformation were accelerated on social media platforms in digital spaces. It's estimated that Alex Jones' videos were recommended at least 15 billion times on YouTube. This is like the New York Times of the conspiracy media. Think of it like that, as, as weird as that sounds. Like, this is the big player. Okay, so you're letting this just wash over you. Yeah. You're watching yeah. dozens of these. This is four hours every day. Pretty much sooner rather than later, I was getting a lot of conspiracy-related suggestions from my autoplay list, and I ate it all up. What these algorithms discovered is that people like to be shown content that they already agree with. Otherwise, your fight or flight mentality kicks in and you quit the app. But if you see content that you already agree with, that's a little boring. And so what they discovered is they need to show you content that's slightly more extreme than your current views, because that keeps you engaged and keeps you sharing it. 
And so over time, if you're always showing content that is slightly more extreme, they end up pushing you down this rabbit hole. Algorithms want to just give you more of what you want, more of what you will interact with, comment on, stuff that you love, stuff that you hate. It's like it's got a feeding tube stuck in your mouth and it just pulls the lever and it's just going in and you cannot stop it. That's terrifying. It's the fact that the world is run by Satan worshippers. If you've been listening to InfoWars, then uh, you'll know this already. He was essentially platformed by InfoWars, which is platformed by YouTube. I think YouTube is one of the most damaging platforms because video content is so engaging, particularly for younger audiences. And so it traps people way earlier in these conspiracy theories and misinformation. Video accounts for over 80% of all consumer traffic on the net. It's the reason Google bought YouTube and Facebook Instagram. But what makes YouTube particularly concerning is over 70% of its traffic is chosen by a recommendation algorithm. That's nearly 1 billion hours of content a day curated by machines with little to no human oversight. And as long as the algorithm is designed to engage our attention for advertising, it will continue to pump out outrage and hate. From an evolutionary point of view, our attention is driven to things which are fearful or things that are extreme in the environment that might actually harm us. If you want to actually attract someone's attention, hate's a really good way to do it. Extreme videos are a really good way to do it. Tech companies exploit this negativity bias for their profit by amplifying it. What role do you think social media plays in pushing you down the rabbit hole? You're able to form an echo chamber with a group of individuals who think exactly like you, who reinforce your beliefs, Facebook, chat, whatever, there's so many people in there that you forget that this is not representative of a community. One of the first Q posts, and if you follow the thumbs, it makes a Q. What I worry about most on the internet is the spread of misinformation. Studies have shown it spreads six times faster than facts, and it's because it's slightly crazy, so people want to share it. They're motivated to share this stuff. Because not only social media apps, but also Google runs algorithms in the background to bias the information that you actually get. So we're all being biased, we're all being corralled. All they're doing is getting us more and more angry. As a result of that, we've become completely polarised. We're so much further apart at a time when we've never been supposed to be more connected. Naturally, as any conspiracy theorist does, they want to tell everyone about it and they want to talk to everyone about it. No one listened to me except for my dad. And my dad just trusted me. There was kind of like a father-son bonding thing and my dad was giving me a lot of respect, which is something I had never gotten from him before. I liked it, so I wanted it to keep going and I pulled him in pretty quickly. Is your dad a member of QAnon? Yeah, he is definitely, he still believes in everything. So how did you get out? I started noticing like inconsistencies in the rules that Q themselves had set up. And then there were just debunks of particular theories that I really held were true. It's almost like pebbles that started an avalanche. It started slowly and then it happened really quickly and all at once. So I just got like all the conspiracy stuff that I like had in my head and I just got it up and like just chucked it in the bin. And I was like, I'm done. What can parents do if they think their kids are being radicalized online? Pre-bunking works quite well. Have a look around and see sort of what problematic content is most popular nowadays uh, and talk to their kids about it and tell them, hey, you're gonna be told all this stuff and it's all wrong, here's why. Here's why the people telling you this have an incentive to make you believe it even though it's not true. Are you gonna get your dad out? The only reason I even really started to talk out, the only reason that I went so public, the only reason, as nice as you are, that I'm talking to you right now is trying to find a way to get my dad out. The more polarized we are, the less empathy we have for each other, and the easier it is to hate. Perhaps the biggest killer of empathy lies at the heart of internet communication. Coming up, these games are designed to just pull in money and that's, they're not interested in protecting children. They've made it so much easier for children to be targeted.
to help protect the privacy of this father and son, we've concealed their identities. So tell me what Fortnite is. It's like a free-for-all shooter game. There's a hundred people in one lobby, and... A hundred people? Yeah, and if you can kill all of the people and you win, it's really fun. One third of the world's population are gamers. It's a $200 billion industry. To fuel its growth, game developers have merged social media into their platforms in the form of game chat. This gives faceless strangers direct access to our children. Talk to me about how the chat works in the game. If you go in squads with like random people, like you don't actually really know them. And if you want to talk to the random people, you can go to game chat, like communicate. So it's an open mic? Yeah. So do you meet a lot of new friends online? Uh, well, kind of, yeah. And you can invite people to your server. So gaming is a combination of gameplay and social and chatting. Uh, yeah. I mean, fundamentally, the reason that gaming companies want us to be more social and chat is because there is specific research that when you make games more social, that does actually deliver a bigger dopamine hit to the brain and therefore has kids and teenagers coming back more often. Like in one day, how long would you game for? If I want to, like, really want to play, then I'll probably play for 15 or, like, 10 hours a day or something. 15 hours? Well, well yeah. One of the benefits of childhood is our world is governed by adults, not online. The illusion of proximity makes us feel safe because our kids are in their bedrooms. But it's just that, an illusion. Bought him a um, Nintendo Switch where he can just play you know, remotely, lay in bed and stuff, and he loved that. The father was unaware his 12-year-old son was a victim. Now, at some point, it's migrated from talking on Fortnite to being told to download WhatsApp on his phone. So he downloaded WhatsApp and then saved this person's number as BFF, which is best friend forever. And this person would text and text and call and BFF. And I was like, who is this BFF? Oh, just a friend from school. I said, well, what's their name? And he couldn't tell me. And so then I um, grabbed his phone and went into his messages and had a look and was just like mortified at what I found. Like they asked for pictures in return for three hundred dollars worth of um, Xbox vouchers, and which he didn't even think twice. He just provided it to them, and yeah. I think one of the most devastating things that our investigators have been seeing for the past five years is what we call coerced, self-produced child sexual abuse imagery, and it's literally young people sometimes as young as six, but more often in the tween area, is when they're being coerced to perform sexual acts. The vast majority of these are filmed in the bedrooms and the bathrooms of the family home. In some of the videos, we can even hear the parents in the background calling them for dinner. So this can literally happen right under our noses. His son was involved in this sexual exploitation for over six months. I feel like I let him down. The guilt is what hurts the most. It was targeted because I didn't provide that support that I should have. It was like a bomb went off in my world. January or February is when I found out that it happened. And then um, on May the 11th, I had a suicide attempt from that. Oh God, it's devastating. Yeah, and I realized that the way that I need to heal through this is to help other people, to educate children and, and, and parents. It's one thing waiting till it happens and then educate the child, but if you can educate a child before it happens, then you've stopped it before it's already, already begun. It's easy to blame parents or the users themselves, but this gives tech companies and the government a free pass. The internet is primarily unregulated and even more concerning, unpoliced. These games are designed to just pull in money and that's, they're not interested in protecting children. They've made it so much easier for children to be targeted. Predatory behaviour is just getting easier and easier. Policing still hasn't caught up with the advancement of the internet. 
I would say that we are 10 years behind where we need to be, where prevention, education and regulation happens. So many other experts in this field say just take the device off them. And that works for some kids, but it doesn't work for a lot. What I tell parents to do is manage the Wi-Fi. If you cut off the Wi-Fi, essentially you're cutting off the dopamine to these devices and they're pretty useless. Have your kids use technology in open areas of the home. Nothing good happens with a digital device behind the closed door of a bedroom or a bathroom. Anonymity is at the heart of privacy and freedom of speech online. But when we hide behind screens and make friends anonymously, it's easy for both hate and abuse to thrive. Coming up, it's not just anonymity that lowers our empathy. It's also the related superpower of invisibility. It was a dating site promising people that they would meet the love of their life, but they were never going to meet these women. In fact, these women didn't even exist. Tell me about Stoyos. What was he like? He was very handsome <laughs> and he had really beautiful eyes. I was attracted to him, but it went beyond that. He had his life together, he wanted to have kids, and I was definitely in love with him. So how did you meet Stelios? I met Stelios through Tinder, the dating site. What got you onto Tinder instead of just going to bars or going to places to meet people? I think it was just the normal thing to do. All my friends were on Tinder and Bumble and such, so we were all just sort of on the same platform and everyone else was doing it, so I kind of just followed. There's no question people can and do find love online. One could argue it's revolutionized love, but when you turn dating into a game with invisibility as a superpower, it's prime for deception. Okay, talk to me about this one. This was on a daily that he would send me like love messages or things that would generally make me feel good and affirmed and cared about. Zoe is Tori's best friend and biggest supporter. I was not completely surprised by how hard she fell for this guy. Tori's like a really beautiful, trusting person. Because that's like, I love you. 200 times. <laughs> he just really knew what to say to kind of get me to keep coming back for more in a way, but also feel special and appreciated. We all have a vulnerability to falling in love and wanting companionship, it's really important. That need and desire we have for companionship, of course, is being exploited by dating apps, keeping us involved and interacting. And if Perhaps you haven't been on an app for a few days, it'll send you a message just to remind you. The invisibility of online dating removes the social monitoring skills and natural instincts that we've evolved to keep us safe when connecting with strangers. We were chatting on Tinder for a while and then he suggested that we talk on Facebook message on audio call. I was happy to just have those audio calls. I didn't even suggest video calling. I had never met Stelios in person, so I wasn't comfortable having that interaction on a video call. For the internet generation, the thought of face-to-face -face communication or even a video call is risky. It's now considered too intimate. And how long were you together online? For around six months. Wow, it's a long relationship, isn't it? Yeah. Obviously, I really wanted to meet up with him multiple times, and we had tried, but a few things happened, I guess, throughout that he couldn't make it. Instead of meeting up, he asked for intimate photos. Looking back now, I noticed that everything I even said, even just normal, general chit-chat, he turned to quite sexual. He's saying, I like you in your PJs, even just panties and a shirt with some pretty socks will do. Can you do that for me? And then you didn't respond well to that. No, I didn't want to do it. So I said no, but he obviously didn't accept that very well. And that's when he mentioned that he would just have to jump on porn instead. 
This is you actually just pushing back and saying, no, mm. no, and he's pushing forward. And that's when obviously he wasn't happy with me saying no and he felt angry. It has definitely become normal to share photos or be so intimate with people online so quickly, but I think what a lot of people don't understand, especially if you're not used to this way of dating, is that these online relationships escalate quickly. You go to greater depths in a shorter amount of time. Prior to meeting up with Stelios, we had agreed on a date and for that whole week he was sending me love letters, told me he had the car packed, we were going to go camping. And then the day of, he literally wanted me to dress up for him and he told me he was at McDonald's and waiting there until I did what he asked me to do. And what did he ask you to do? He asked me to film myself, do intimate things to myself. I know it's easy to think, why would somebody send intimate photos and videos of themselves? But when you're in an online relationship, you build this trust with somebody that you care about. This is how relationships are online. We're instinctively driven to self-disclose when building relationships. But online invisibility amplifies this disinhibition effect. Like being drunk, it can turn us into impulsive, risk-taking overshares. I didn't want to lose him, so I did it because this person was important to me. So then I did, filmed it quickly, got it over and done with, and then he blocked me. So nothing? Nothing. And then what happened? What did you do? And then it was radio silence, and I realised that I was blocked off everything we communicated on, and there was no chatting to Stelios ever again. So how did you feel when you found out you'd been catfished? I felt kind of like the rage of like sadness, anger all at once. I felt depressed. And that's when it kind of hit me that everything was a lie, moving to Greece was a lie. All the plans we sort of had made and we had created together was not true. I felt like my body was out there and there's no way that I could get that back. Those images and videos I had never sent to anybody before. I felt like I didn't want to be alive anymore. Sorry, I'm gonna cry. It's okay. Just like. I was so heartbroken. I've never felt that pain in my life. And what did you do next? Ended up heading over to Zoe's house. And that's when she mentioned to Google reverse image search a photo. So there's like multiple websites that you can use to reverse image search something. You basically put a photo in there, click search. If it has any hits, it will show you all of the websites or social media profiles where this photo has been found. Let's try this one. It came back with, you know, multiple news articles and different sites where that photo had been used. And then through that, we found out that it was a Greek singer. Well, so he's picked someone super popular. Yeah, and somewhere else, not in Australia. Wow, it's audacious, isn't it? Mm. That's incredible. He chose to be someone that has nearly a million followers. A big part of the solution to catfishing maybe early education. And we have to help prepare our children to make good decisions. And we have to let them know that once they share an intimate image or a video, it's out of their control forever. So um, I often talk to my kids about the grandma test. If you wouldn't want, you know, Grandma Glenda to see it, why would you post it online? Unfortunately, it's not just the users that are taking advantage of online invisibility. It's the companies themselves. Online dating companies make money from our attention. And to do that, some will do just about anything, including fraud. I was paid 30 cents per message. Hi, honey, how are you today? What's your day like? What, what did you do today? And it was a dating site promising people that they would meet the love of their life, but they were never going to meet these women. In fact, these women didn't even exist. It was commercial catfishing at its highest.
This whistleblower wanted to remain anonymous, but was happy to explain the details of the deception. So this is your interface? Yes. I would just say, ready to take a message, and I hit yes, and then this is what drops down. So what this is, is this is the person here that I'm playing in this particular moment, and this is the man that is messaging her. And whose image is that? I have no idea. No idea who's So that's the person you're playing? Yes. I've been married, all these little generic things that I need to keep remembering just to keep the story right, and then try and put that relationship between those two people in my head and carry on their conversation as if it flows, as if he's been talking to that same person the whole time. It's so deceptive. It's, it's really deceptive. Because it's a dating site, there is an expectation that you're going to meet. Yes. Um, so they give you advice on how to avoid the meeting. Yes. Or avoid even the meeting conversation. And yes. they say, when dealing with requests to meet, please remember the meetings are never arranged, never promised, and never happen. I mean, just it's a dating site. It's a dating site. The deception is incredible. Yeah. Did you start to feel guilty? Very guilty. Very guilty mainly by the older generation because it was the older generation that wanted to meet you and they thought they were finding the love of their life and they were going to be happy and they were going to meet and you're the love of his life and you've promised me all these things and when am I going to see you and I'm sick of being alone and at the end I just I was a blank and every time I just I didn't know what to say to these to the people. She never knew what dating company it was which makes it even more concerning it could be any of them. Coming up, online invisibility enables deception and abuse. But it's not just people fooling other people. Technology itself is facilitating the spread of hate and confusing what is real and what isn't. Left to their own devices, tech companies will just not be prioritising the safety of women on their platforms. I love the t-shirt, by the way. You know what it's saying? Can you guess? Oh, I, I didn't, bet it's a machine learning. I didn't notice the book. Emma Jane is an associate professor specializing in emerging technology. Her partner, Armin, is a university lecturer and tech whiz. So you're gonna deep fake me? Yeah, take a selfie of your face. In the beginning, it was used for entertainment, a simple face swap. So now choose what you want. Matthew McConaughey. Oh my, wow. If I start with all right, all right, all right. Today, Deepfake is so popular, its usage is doubling every six months. Technically, how is that done? The AI takes only the important bits of your face, and then it has to understand every single pixel in the photo that uh, is part of your face. And it removes that and puts someone else's face on it. What I find really chilling, we're able to achieve this level of realistic movement with just a single static image. What was once fun is now a weapon of hate. So when we look at the deep fake apps that, you know, our kids and our teens are using, you know, it's great for a laugh, but the same technology that is powering those, you know, happy fun time apps is also being used in a really nefarious and oppressive way against women. There are a multitude of AI-powered image-based apps that allow you to remove the clothing of any photo that you give them. So this is one of the generic cutout figures on PowerPoint. And as you can see... That's her naked. ...absolutely removed all of her clothing. The algorithm removes clothes and predictively generates the naked parts. It's a similar algorithm to the one used in self-driving cars to imagine road scenarios. This type of attack can absolutely ruin your professional reputation. If the first page of, you know, of a Google search shows you in a bunch of deepfake porn movies, uh, then that is how people will see you in the world. Noel Martin porn videos. So, how did it all start? 
So I was 18 years old and I randomly decided to Google image reverse search myself and I used an image in the reverse search of me at 17 years old and that image along with many many other images were plastered over pornographic sites across multiple pages of search results and you know my life changed. There are thousands of deepfake pornographic images of Noelle plastered across dozens of websites. They're still being produced today. And how did you feel when you saw the images for the first time? I felt the most excruciating feeling of shock, horror, just so many questions were racing through my brain, like, why was this happening? Who was responsible? The people were targeting me for, I think, at least about a year before I found out what was happening. Well, so why do you think they targeted you? My understanding is, uh, in the beginning, it was, I think, sexual motivation where I think they, they fetishized me and my body type and the way I looked. Online abuse is not gender neutral. The vast majority is against women. Do you still post? Yes, I do. It's just so unfortunate that we say to people like me or people who have been victims of this that, you know, you should change the way that you dress. Don't post something. Maybe be careful of what you post. Um, I hate that with a passion because the people who are disproportionately going to be affected by this are women mm -hmm. and, and, and women of colour. I shouldn't have to suffer the consequences of other people's actions. Online culture allows for a lot of that kind of dehumanization through memes, through modifying images of people, creating deep fakes of them. And once you stop thinking of someone as another human being, then it becomes reasonable to treat them like a pest. Noelle's perpetrators are invisible and anonymous sexual predators that suffer no consequences for their actions. She had no known enemies and no idea why they were doing it. So I was effectively told by the police to, you know, control my privacy settings um, and to contact the webmasters of the site. And there was one instance where a webmaster said they would only delete the images if I sent them nude photos of myself within 24 hours. So I've always dreamt of being a lawyer um, and, you know, I went through law school. I graduated, I was admitted as a lawyer, but everything that's happened to me, the, the profile I have, I believe has adversely affected my ability to gain employment. And because I couldn't find something, I went back to university and have become a researcher and I'm currently researching the metaverse. We're on the verge of a new era in tech in the form of what's been called the metaverse. What that refers to is an artificial world where we don't just go to play games, but that's where we have our meetings. That's where we catch up with our friends. Strategically, Facebook wants to skip over mobile and move to the metaverse because it'll finally give them an opportunity to own the hardware and own the operating system, which will allow them to get even more data about you. Why specialise in the metaverse? So one of the main motivations behind uh, my research is, is my background of being someone who's experienced image-based sexual abuse and, and deep fake abuse. Where are you? Um, no? It's loading and I'm headed in your room though. Okay. Facebook is a well-oiled public relations machine and it has a trillion dollar imperative to sell the metaverse. What you're seeing is actually a rendering of my pre-recorded codec avatar. Over the past couple of years, we've made quite a bit of progress with codec avatars. This metaverse promotional video boasts of the realism of their avatars. The person you are seeing is a digital copy of a real person. This takes deepfake to a whole new level, and with it, even more risks. One of the biggest worries for me on top of privacy, surveillance, copyright, liability issues is the capacity for people to misappropriate another person's three-dimensional, hyper-realistic self 
into pornography, into saying things that they didn't say, into, you know, being groped or sexually abused. When Facebook rolled out the beta version of its current um, metaverse platform, uh, one of its beta testers, a VR researcher, was gang raped within seconds of turning up by a bunch of male avatars who took photos as they did it. That's inside. I thought I'd experience it myself. Oh, wow. The questionable behavior started within minutes. But what's she doing? Can you see what they, they've drawn? No. I can see a penis. Oh, that's a, that's a penis. And it wasn't long before the abuse began. There was two guys fondling, um, fondling a woman, like going through her with their hands and then rubbing, like, I think he said to me that they're getting used to wearing clothes. The anonymity of it is super creepy. And you had, like, four or five people around you drawing penises. It's scary, really, and potentially the future. Mm -hmm. But what's really concerning is we're only at the beginning of what this virtual technology will deliver. Imagine the potential for abuse of those technologies, given what we've seen. Given the way people have already abused the internet when it couldn't do any of these amazing things, imagine what's going to happen. Deepfakes will become an even greater destructive force in society. And with the rise of the metaverse, we need to prepare for a world where online abuse is common and seeing is no longer believing. Coming up, when hate becomes normalized and our empathy diminished. What do you think when you see that photo? A lot of heartache. The consequences can be devastating. I don't want to admit to the world that hate is becoming normalized, but it is becoming normalized. And it's the intensity of hatred. It's the openness of hatred. When there are no consequences for hate, then that's literal impunity. Normalization is the result of zero consequences for malignant behavior. So what was she like as a kid? She was bubbly, she was like a hurricane. That's how all the kids and us used to describe it. She used to just run in and she was like a hurricane. She actually wanted to be a zoologist. A zoologist? A zoologist. Wow. Not just a vet, a zoologist. And she would have loved working in the zoos. She would have been a Bindi Irwin. Left us on a Monday, and I'm still in a dream. Think you kill me in hope? Soon, but heaven's now your home. She was just someone that wanted to take the world's pain. She just wanted to make people smile. A beautiful chick. And that's not just because she's my daughter. <coughs> this is little Pepsi. Hey, Pepsi. <laughs> Hello, darling. He's got the brown eyes like Jess. Pepsi's, yeah, Jessie's dog. She just loved animals. What do you think when you see that photo? A lot of heartache. A lot of torment, you know? The world stole our girl. They really did. They took her away. So Jessie was probably about 11. And I bought her a phone because she was in high school and just security-wise. So whenever she needed anything or if she, yeah, was to get into trouble, she could contact me. And how into the phone was she? Oh, very. Very. Oh. Phone's their lifeline. Phone's their, phone's their life at that age. Yeah, everything's done on on the phone. Jessie was about 11 when the bullying started. She stuck up for an overweight girl that was at school um, and then she got picked on. And from there it just, yeah, it went berserk. 
what social media platforms was she on? Uh, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat mainly. Snapchat was the thing back then. Snapchat's the tricky one, right? Yeah, well, the, Talk it to me about deleted. Snapchat. They delete posts within 24 hours and, um, you know, the mean messages Jess used to get, I'd say screenshot them, you know, but she'd go, if you screenshot them, the person that sent them knows, so then she'll cop it worse. Mm. Yeah. Snapchat is the perfect platform for cyber abuse because the snaps or messages disappear without a trace in a matter of minutes. This disinhibits the bullies by giving them immunity from detection. We we try putting it on aeroplane mode, or I'd take it off her. It'd actually make her worse. She felt more isolated and she had no one to turn to. She started backing away from friends because she didn't want to put any pain on anyone else, so she wouldn't talk to anyone about any issues she was having. So these are actually the messages that got sent to my daughter. And the bully states, I'm going to make your life a living hell. You wait, mutt. You will be crying yourself to sleep every night. And my daughter responded by saying, I hate myself. I already do cry myself to sleep. And the bully came back, I'm going to ruin you. You wait, you feral looking thing. Off now, bye bye maggot. Wait till I see you at school, mate. You're fing gone, pathetic mole. And she got away with it. The sad thing is, my daughter already hated herself. Jess suffered from severe body image dissatisfaction, an issue amplified by her use of social media. In 2018, Facebook internal research warned that Instagram, owned by Facebook, made body image issues worse for one in three teenage girls. Two years later, the report was leaked. They allow kids to go on their social media platforms and, you know, they don't stop things from happening. What's really challenging about cyberbullying is you're not leaving the bullying at the school gate. It's invasive and pervasive, and that's what makes it so insidious because it follows children on their smartphones, in their pockets, into their homes at all hours of the night. Keyboard warriors, yeah, they're bullies, but they just don't have the guts to do it in your face. So they, they don't see the damage that they cause. They don't see the pain that's left behind. When me and Jack got home that day, she, you just feel the air in the, in the house when we walked in, it was just cold. Put everything on the kitchen bench, walked through, looked through her bedroom, Pepsi's laying on her pillow and there's no sign of her. And then as Jack's walked into his room, he's yelled at me and I've walked straight in there and she's just gone. I know in my head it wasn't my fault, but my heart says oh, I should have protected her. I should have fought harder. Yeah. I should have been there that day. We shouldn't have had an argument. No. Oh. You don't want any other parent. I wouldn't want my worst enemy going through this. No, you wouldn't. I, I no, really you wouldn't. wouldn't. Wish it on your worst enemy. No, That's I wouldn't wish it on the bully's mum. I really wouldn't. You wouldn't. Yeah. You really wouldn't. And there's so many parents out there who have lost kids. Come and say hello. Hey, Jack. <laughs> How are you? That's good. You should actually get his arm. What's on your arm? Ah, uh, so these are what Jesse drew in a book, and then now yeah, I got them placed on my arm. So. Oh, what does it say? Uh, always laugh when you can. It is cheaper than medicine. And that's her handwriting yeah. too. Yeah. They copied all that. Yeah. And yeah, the top one's just what I liked. Yeah. Wow. I speak out because parents don't need to bury their kids. The system won't help them. Suicide is not the only way out of cyberbullying. While far from perfect, the eSafety Commission is a resource that could help. You know, Most don't even know it exists. She actually said it was like I'd known 
If a child is being seriously cyberbullied, and that is described as seriously harmful, humiliating, intimidating, or threatening, and they report it to a social media site and it doesn't come down, we serve as that safety net and they could come to us. That triggers a regulatory investigation. We will go to Snap, we will go to Instagram and say, you missed this and we think it's serious cyberbullying, we would like you to take it down. This is a quote by a, a person called Andrew Bosworth. He's a vice president at Facebook. And here's yeah. what he said. All the work we do in growth is justified, regardless of whether it costs someone a life by exposing someone to bullies. Right. Wow. Has he got a heart? What do you say to something like that? He doesn't, he doesn't care that I lost my daughter. Yeah, wow. Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg issued a retraction after the memo was leaked, stating he strongly disagreed with Bosworth's comments. What would you say to Facebook if you could speak to the founder, Mark Zuckerberg? He needs to, you know, own up for the duty of care he's not doing. Social media plays probably a good 90% of what happened to Jess. All the social media, they've all got blood on their hands. It's not just my daughter, so many kids and they still won't listen. You know, you bring your kids up to try and protect them in this world. And how can we protect them as parents if social media won't protect them? The normalization of hate erodes our empathy by making us indifferent to abuse and desensitized to the extremes. Hating online is now considered a part of life, but it doesn't need to be that way. We are still at the infancy stage of technological development. Scary as that might be, there's still time for change. I don't believe the tech founders started out to destroy society, but destruction is the collateral damage of their ruthless pursuit of profit from our attention. This isn't about individuals, and I'm not gonna push the responsibility onto parents or onto users. This is about platforms that are profiting from hate and misinformation, and about politicians who are failing to act, sometimes because they're receiving lobbying dollars from those companies, from Meta, from Google, from Twitter, instead of doing the right thing, which is to actually put into place protection for society. The internet was born from this incredibly powerful belief and opportunity to connect people around the world. And I think largely through its history, there was this great optimism and it only started to become apparent in the 2010s that once you saw the true scale of it and the true impact, that people realized that there were actually negative repercussions as well, and these needed to be dealt with. While there is no silver bullet, there are solutions. The first step is awareness, which is the purpose of this documentary. The guidance I would have for parents is be engaged with their kids' online lives the way they are, their everyday lives. Make sure you're setting the privacy settings on highest by default so that your children's data isn't being utilized, but also so people can't reach out to them and contact them uh, without your knowledge because we can't be there all the time. Get rid of all your notifications, all those bings and bangs and dings and dongs. They actually cause the attentional grabbing. They are the cues that are causing the addiction. We need teenagers to actually go out there and socialise face to face, spend time with each other and learn how to socialise. To stop digital dependence, we need to stop. Take a pause. Boredom is good for us. <laughs> it helps us. It offers a reset for the system. So doing nothing is one of the first things I'll recommend. My attention is mine. It's important to me. It is precious. Personally, I have removed all of my social media as a conscientious objection to the business models that are driving these platforms. The only thing tech companies really understand is money. So until the attention-based advertising model is changed, nothing substantial will happen. I think they claim publicly they're making progress, but it's against their fiduciary duty to make all that much progress. And so unless the business model changes, unless real regulation comes into play, They've built themselves into a trap. Once you make so much money from ads, what is the alternative and how could they possibly change business models now? You're shifting the behavior of two billion people. So one thing has become abundantly clear. 
We need regulation. Tech companies should not have unregulated access to our minds or the minds of our children. We are so far behind when it comes to regulation. Technology is going like this and, and our governing institutions are flatlining. I think social media has to be regulated. The main reason is actually that social media is a monopoly. You know, in the same way that we wouldn't let a single individual control our entire water system. It's crazy to think that a single individual, namely Mark Zuckerberg, controls the vast majority of communication on social media. If you could do one thing to make the internet better, what would that be? I would recommend putting software in which bans people who type up inappropriate words or nudes so you can like ban them straight away. I would definitely improve a lot of the social media apps. If you're getting bullied online, there would be an automatic thing that just deletes the account so then they can't contact you anymore. The internet, I wouldn't say needs fixing, it's the way people use it that needs fixing. Likes, for example. If you remove likes, then the fundamentals of social media come crumbling down. But maybe that's a good thing to do. Maybe social media isn't the way things should be. It's up to us to decide what we're willing to accept. We're on the cusp of a global crisis, and at this stage, we're still in control. But change needs to happen, and it needs to happen now. I think we'll look back 10 years from now on what we allowed these tech companies to do, and we'll be embarrassed. At least I hope so. This is not going. This is not going on air. This is the making of. But I also gave my girls devices when they were young. I also used it as a pacifier. Is that a pony? What the? Pony. There's a pony that lives here. OK, all right. Do you want me to feed the cats? I never thought in my life that I'd meet someone that was in QAnon. Yeah, I never thought I'd meet someone who was on the ground transfer. <laughs> Do you know what Amigo is? I'm Meggle. Sorry, thanks for the correction. <laughs>